Um, Thank you. All right, so here I'm talk here to talk about water quality from uh, a freshwater mussel perspective. So clear, clearly they need some freshwater mussels in there to filter feed and clean their filter. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I'm just going to keep going and we'll try to figure this out. So I already kind of talked about why mussels are important. Um, so you can see they're in current siphon. It's larger of the two siphons and it has those little finger-like projections to prevent large things from coming in. And then their excrement siphon is right next to it. So when I do this talk at the Children's Water Festival, they always think it's amusing that these animals have their mouth and their butt right next to each other. Um, but you can see here that you know we've got the algae growing on the mussels, and then here we have snails grazing on the algae. <clears throat> um, mussels can move. Like I said, they, they burrow in the substrate. Um, so they move up and down. But they also can move horizontally. They have a foot. Um, and it, it's more like a big flexible tongue. And what they do is they stick their foot out and they hook it in the substrate and then they pull their shell. And they stick their foot out and hook and pull. So they don't move very fast. And they don't have eyes and very little in the way of a brain. So they have no sense of direction. <laughs> so if you were out in our rivers and streams during uh, some of the drought periods, you would oftentimes find trails like this in the, the broad, flat, sandy areas where they were trying to get to deeper water, um, but were kind of confused. Um, if there's enough of a gradient, they can follow a temperature, uh, a temperature uh, change down the slope to get to, to deeper water, but in a lot of our areas, they go like this until they either A, make it to deeper water, or B, get eaten by raccoons, um, or C, uh, die of exposure. So here's the life cycle I was talking about. Just like us, they've got male and female. Um, their sex life is a little less interesting. The male releases his sperm into the water column, where it hopefully floats downstream and finds the incurrent siphon of the female of his species. Um, and the eggs are fertilized and brooded on special chambers on their gills called marsupium um, until they reach their larval stage, which are called glochidia. There's two main types of glochidia. The ones here on the bottom that have those wicked looking hooks, they can attach to the external fins of the fish host, whereas the ones on top that look kind of like double toilet seat lids, they only attach to the gill filaments of the fish host. Um, these, this is a micron um, electroscope picture, so these are all about the same size. These are actually two different species. Um, I did fish host studies on this one. It was bonkers. It was hard to find. And actually, I started doing fish host studies on that one in 1997, and they just figured out what the fish host was last year up in Minnesota. So sometimes these are tricky buggers. So they attach to the fish host, and while they're on the fish host, they actually transform into their juvenile form. So they form a little tissue packet around themselves. They do get some nutrients from the mussels or from the fish host, so they are, are considered slightly parasitic, but not to the extent that they harm the fish host. And they tend to only attach to the young um, fish. There's evidence that the older the fish gets, it develops an immunity um, to the mussels, and they won't act as fish hosts anymore. So once they transform into their juvenile phase, um, that's when they drop off the fish host and hopefully land in good habitat. So if you look at these guys, they're really all they are are two shell halves and the muscle that allows them to open and close. While they are on their fish host, they actually grow and that's when their foot develops. But their foot isn't strong enough yet at that point to hold them in the substrate. So they actually attach to the substrate by a long, clear thread called the bissel thread. And this is one of the things that makes them mussels and not clams. So if you've ever gotten mussels in a restaurant, you know that beard <laughs> that's on there? That's the byssus that those mussels in the ocean use to hold on to a rock. Now, the blue mussels that you eat in a restaurant or the zebra mussels that we have here as invasive species, um, they attach permanently as an adult for the rest of their life. Whereas with our native mussels, they only have it for the first few years of their life until their foot is strong enough to dig them into the substrate and hold on. <laughs> so for scale, that's on my hand. Um, the one on the bottom with the bissel thread, that probably dropped off the fish host earlier that summer. And uh, the one above is a year, about a year older. The time that they spend on the fish host really varies by species. Some of them will actually overwinter on the fish host. And some of them are only on the fish host for a week or two. Um, and that can also vary by water temperatures as well. So 
the ones that you know uh, have the wicked hooks and can attach to the fins, they tend to be what we call host generalists, and they'll attach to pretty much any fish that swims by and transform. But there's um, the ones that look like the double toilet seats oftentimes are host specialists, and they will only transform into their juvenile form on a certain species or a small group of fish. And uh, so they've developed pretty cool strategies to actually make sure they're attracting the right fish host. Because if the Glaucidia attach to the wrong fish host, they don't transform, they just die. So the first one is called conglutinates, which is a big fancy word for a mucus packet. Um, in which all the, the glochidia are packaged, and then the female spits it out onto the bottom of the river. Fish swims along, thinks, hey, that looks like a tasty meal. Takes a bite. Some of them get eaten, but some of them can pass over the gills and attach to the gills. So some of them um, look like they actually mimic insect larvae. Anything that is an, like, looks like an eye spot or an antennae, those are unfertilized eggs. And then these little bumps are actually the individual glochidia in there. Now, some of them don't look like much, these little feathery things, um, but apparently that still looks tasty to fish. Uh, but they're all pretty small, about the size of that, that penny there. Then there's fish that does what's called a super, or muscle that does what's called a super conglutinate. And the super conglutinate tends to be up about three inches long. And here's the mama muscle, and it's attached to um, the mama by a long, uh, clear thread that can wave in the current. And here's where we see if my videos will play. <clears throat> no. Okay, goody. Um, well, if you could see it, it would be, you would see it waving in the current. And it basically looks like a little fish. It has a little eye spot and a lateral line stripe. Um, and so basically she's going fishing for her fish host. Um, this is the black sand shell. Um, the video's from Missouri, but we do have these up here in Iowa. Um, the, the Skunk River, or not Skunk River, the, the Des Moines River above uh, Sailorville, um, up in the Fort Dodge area is a really good spot for black sand shells. This one's unique in that the female comes completely out of the substrate and lays on top. Um, she has a very primitive mantle lure. The mantle is this layer of tissue on either side of the shell, and that's actually what secretes the shell. So some species have evolved so that it grows outside of it. Um, these are the marsupium where the babies are growing. And then here you can see a bite's been bitten out. So she lays on the top and kind of waves her. Okay, it's not going to work. Basically, it's kind of saying, hey, fishies, check this out. Good eats. Um, these guys use, use walleye and smallmouth bass as fish hosts. So apparently that looks very tasty to a walleye or smallmouth bass. But even tastier to them is this one. The plain pocket book, which is the most common species we have here in Iowa rivers and streams, um, does a minnow-like mental lure. And so you can see the eye spot and the tail fin, and then this big gray blob in the middle, that's the marsupium. And oftentimes the female will be completely under the substrate, so all you can see is the little minnow um, waving in the current. So the, the mantle does get eaten sometimes, but they can regrow it. Um, this one. The mantle is meant to mimic a crayfish, which I'm guessing my video won't work since the other ones didn't. But this one actually, the muscle does the sort of scuttling back motion of a crayfish as well. So this would be the tail fin of the crayfish and that would be the antennae. Um, man, I really wish this video would play. This is a really cool one. This is the snuff box. Nope. Um, it's a species we used to have here in Iowa, but we don't anymore. It's been wiped out. It uses a single species of fish called the northern log perch. Northern log perch find food by turning over rocks with their heads, so they have a thick reinforced skull. So the female has these little tooth-like projections on either side of her shell. So if this video was working, you would see an unsuspecting northern log perch swim into frame and turn over the rock, at which point the female clamps down on the on the fish's head and shoots the glaucidia into its mouth. And she holds on until she's done. And then she lets him go and he can swim away and say, what a terrible day he's been having to his friends. <laughs> now, if this was a different species of fish, their head would get crushed. So, anybody have any idea what could be threats to mussels here in Iowa? Sedimentation. Yep, habitat loss is the biggest one here in Iowa. 
Freshwater mussels love a good mix of sand and gravel and rock for the substrates. There are some species that do well in the fine silty mud. They tend to be the thinner shelled species. Um, but for the most part, they want stable substrate. Um, we've dumped a, lo a lot of soil into our, um, our waterways in the last 150 years. Even if we could somehow magically stop that, we'd still be dealing with the legacy effects for decades to come. Um, we've also straightened our streams, which has made the water move a lot faster. It's changed the hydrology, so the mussels can't always hang on um, in those spots. And then we built dams that can cut off access to their fish hosts. And now we're starting to take them out. And um, if you don't consider the mussels in that, um, which is one of the instigations behind my master's project, was they'd had a dam removal a couple of years before where they hadn't thought about the mussels, so they just took out the dam, and all of a sudden they had all these mussels exposed and dying in the impoundment. Um, pollution is another one. Um, they've done toxicity testing, and they've found that the um, glochidia and juvenile forms of freshwater mussels are the most, the most sensitive aquatic organism to ammonia pollution that they've tested so far. Um, thankfully, pesticides don't seem to be an issue. It tends to be the ammonia and then the metals. And then finally, we have invasive species. Um, you guys have probably all heard about the zebra mussels. They're bad news. They'll attach to any hard surface, including our native species, um, where they can prevent them from feeding or burrowing into the substrate for the winter, um, or they just compete for the same resources. Asian claim uh, is not as big of a threat. They just are a, comp a competitor for resources as well. Um, the, big, the new one is the black carp. This is another one like the grass carp and the silver carp that was brought in for the fish farming industry. And oh, they never escape. And oh, they're, um, they're genetically made so they can't reproduce. Well, big surprise, they've escaped. And now they've got evidence of them successfully reproducing in the Mississippi and working their way north. Um, unlike the silver and grass carp, the black carp is a molluscivore. So they eat mosques. And they will eat our native species. So before um, Europeans got here, Historically, Native Americans did eat them. You don't want to do it now. That's always the big question I get is, can you eat them? I say, it, you might as well just drink the water straight from the river. They're filtering everything out that we put in there, and you got very sick. Um, but they would eat, use them as food. They'd use their shells for decoration as tools. And then they would also grind up the shells and mix it with the clay to make the pottery stronger. Um, once the European settlers got here, at first they were only interested in the freshwater pearls that our mussels produce, so they were already starting to harvest them for that. But then in the, um, 1889, a German immigrant by the name of Johann Bugler opened the first button factory in Muscatine, Iowa. And within a few years, Muscatine was known as the button capital of the world. So these guys are standing in piles of shells. So you know, if you think this guy's maybe six foot, that's like a 12 foot pile of shell. They were pulling out every single mussel they could find. Just in the um, 1912 to 1914 period alone, 672 tons of shells were taken from interior rivers and streams. That's not including the Mississippi River in Iowa. So that's more than a million mussels. We've already seen how crazy their life cycle is, how complicated it is. Some of these species that they were taking, they lived to be 70, 80, 90 years old. So um, they were massively overharvesting them more than um, Mother Nature could replace them. So basically the stocks crashed by the late, th uh, late 20s and uh, it's about the time when uh, plastic became more popular. Then in the 1950s they discovered that freshwater mussel makes great nucleuses for cultured pearls. So now they harvest our thicker shelled species, drill balls out of them, ship them over to Asia where they're put inside the marine pearl oyster get coated with a few layers of the, of the nacre. And since it's the same material, it adheres really well. So you can get a really large, perfectly round pearl very, very quickly. Whereas natural pearls are very rarely perfectly round, and it takes a very long time to get them very large. So nowadays, if you have a cultured pearl, about uh, 80 to 90 percent of that is actually going to be freshwater mussel shell. All right, here we get to Iowa. Historically, in Iowa, we had just over 50 species of freshwater mussels. The ones that have X's on them are believed to be extirpated in Iowa. It means we don't have them here anymore, but they're not completely extinct in their range. Um, those with the red circles are state listed, and the ones with the yellow circles are federally listed. So what we knew about mussels in the past was based on a couple of surveys that were done um, in the 80s and 90s. So in 1984, 
guy named Frust, was contracted by the Fish and Wildlife Service and the DNR to survey what he determined was the best remaining mussel habitat in Iowa. Um, and those are the yellow dots. And then in 1980, uh, 1998, a grad student up at Iowa State went out and tried to resample as many of those sites as she could. Um, and then she used the, the land use data around the mussel sites to try to develop a predictive model um, to tell her where other good mussel sites might be. So those additional red dots are the sites she added the next year based on her predictive model. Um, and then, <coughs> excuse me, the blue sites are some work that was done by an undergraduate up at Luther in northeastern Iowa. The yellow sites are the keys though because if in 1984 they had at least four species of mussel found there, when it was resampled in 1998, there were less than 50% of the original species. It was put on the state's impaired waters list. So this is what it was like when I came to Iowa. We had all these impaired segments um, for freshwater mussels. So like I said, based on that, we got a grant from the EPA to do a seven-year statewide freshwater mussel survey. Um, I tried to cover more of the state than had previously been covered. We wanted to go back to as many of the previously surveyed sites so we could have continuous data, but we also wanted to get information about what's going on in the rest of the state. Just because Frest in 84 said, oh, that's not good muscle habitat, um, doesn't mean that it necessarily was. Um, so basically I got paid for seven summers to go out and play in the water. It was awesome. I'm gonna be very sad this summer when I don't get to. Um, so, and based on that, if we saw that there were it, and at those sites where we resampled in the impaired segments, um, if the number of species we found had gone up above that 50% threshold, we were actually able to delist 12 segments um, here in Iowa. And then there's another two here in the Iowa River and the Cedar that we're proposing for delisting. But I had issues with the methodology for listing because this 1984 survey was a, a qualitative time search survey, whereas in 1998 she was doing quantitative, you know, meter squared sampling. And that can oftentimes miss rarer species. <coughs> so I wanted something that would give us a little bit more robust data. So I've actually developed a biotic index for mussels here in Iowa. Um, and it's based on the number of species found, the number of threatened and endangered species that we find, how much of the amount of, you know, so if we found 100 mussels, is 10% of that threatened and endangered species? Is it 50%? Our catch per unit effort. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting old, over a chest cold. So basically we were doing time searches for this one too. So it was usually myself and my helper and we would go out and sample. So if we sampled a site, each of us for two hours, that would be two person hours. And if we found 100 mussels, then our catch per unit effort would be 50 mussels per person hour. Um, how much of the, the, the percent total that we found is made up of just the three dominant species? So if we had 100 mussels, but 80% of that was made up of just the top three species, and you know, say we ten, found 10, people, 10 species total, so that 7% would represent the other 20%, um, that's not so good. So we wanted to look at how dominant certain species were. Um, and then because they need to use their fish host part of the life cycle, we used the fish host tolerance ratings from our fish index of biotic integrity to determine a fish host tolerance ranking as well. Um, and then we did a Shannon Wiener diversity index, which is basically looking at how even um, our species are. You know, so are, do we have certain dominant ones or not? And then um, a reproductive factor, because mussels can live for a very long time. Um, so you, you don't want to have a senior, a community of senior citizens that's just dying out and, and no, no new people are, or new, new individuals are coming in. So mussels, <coughs> you can actually age them, kind of growth rings, kind of like trees, up to a certain point. Once they reach about seven or eight years, the lines start to grow really close and it gets hard to determine. <coughs> but for our purposes, we were looking for any mussels that were five and under and what 
proportion of the total population that that worked out as. <coughs> and then, because all mussels are filter feeders, you can't look at different feeding met methods as, as a way of comparison, comparing them like we do with our fish or our inverts. Um, so we look at life history strategies. Um, and basically that looks at how long lived they are, um, what kind of reproductive strategy they have. Um, so it was a way of dividing them into different groups. So we take all these different metrics, add them together and get a score. And then I was able to rank our segments where we sampled based on how well they were doing. So anything in purple is ranked as excellent. Um, so if you remember the map where they were sampling, there wasn't a whole lot on the Des Moines or even the upper Des Moines. Some of those things were ranked as excellent. Um, they didn't do much down here in the lower skunk. So obviously they missed some things. Anything that's ranked as green is good. Orange is fair and red is poor. Um, so this is just a way for us to compare the different segments to each other. Um, we haven't gotten into the weeds of how are we going to impair things on this or anything like that. So this is still fairly new. Um, I only finished analyzing the data this winter. So, But this is a way to just start to get an idea of how are our rivers and streams doing when it comes to mussels. So um, you can see the coconut is not doing so great which is sad because it's got beautiful habitat. You go out there and you're snorkeling and looking for mussels and you're not finding any and you're like, this is perfect mussel habitat, why aren't there any in here? So I know they've had a lot of fish kills up there which would mean ammonia inputs. Um, and adults can kind of, they can literally clam up and ride out an ammonia spill if it's temporary, um, but it's gonna kill off the young ones. So if you get that happening enough, you're gonna get a community of senior citizens that just dies out and then that's it. So that was very, very fast to try to make up time. Um, I'm happy to take questions if there's, I think we're at time now, so we'd cut into the break a little bit, but if you have questions. What level of ammonia is toxic? Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what, what level they found. Um, and you know, with that, it's, it's you know, the LC50s. And, but I do know that they recommended changing the ammonia water quality standards um, to another factor is if there are muscles present or not. Okay. Um, not here. On the Mississippi, there have been. Um, there have been some things with the train developments um, where they've actually gotten some funding um, uh, reimbursement for that based on um, at least you probably know a little bit more about that, um, where they have, they, they, they have come up with evaluation method now for kind of now that we have better methods to grow them in the facility, um, they calculate how much it would cost to replace these muscles and how old they were. Um, so there is a method now for, for muscle kills. Right. Um, I think it's just not all the hydrologic alterations we've done over the years. The habitat's just not there in a lot of places. Um, if you look back at the previous slide, you can see a lot of the areas that are listed as red and yellow are in areas that have been heavily channelized. You know, all of these streams down here. I mean, we were scrambling down 35, 40 foot banks to get down into some of those systems in southwestern Iowa, they've, they've been incised that much because they were straightened. So I think that's more of an issue now. But I mean, really, the, the mussels, we sort of did a one, two, three sucker punch. First of all, we were massively over-harvesting them. And then about the time that was declining was really the era of the big stream straightening, um, you know, tiling uh, input. And then we were also dumping, dumping tons of um, nutrients and, and ammonia into the system, and there's communities here in Iowa that didn't get wastewater treatment plants until the mid-80s. So, you know, sometimes I think it's a miracle we have any muscles here in Iowa at all. Yeah, how, how long did it take to recover, like, from our 30? Um, 
I don't, I don't know if they're ever going to re return to the levels that they were before um, settlement, before European settlement got here. Um, part of that is just that we've altered things so much. Um, and, you know, and even if, and at this point, there are efforts to restore most populations. Um, the federally endangered Kagan's eye uh, pearly mussel was wiped out in Iowa, but we've successfully reintroduced it into the Iowa and Wapskinica rivers. Um, I'm working with the Minnesota DNR on a project to reintroduce mussels into their part of the Cedar River that got wiped out after all the inputs from the spam plants up in Austin and the slaughterhouses there. Um, and then we're also working on a project with Nebraska to reintroduce some mussels into Missouri River drainages, too. So I think it's going to take some human effort to, you know, because we've got dams now that are blocking access um, to source populations in some places, and, uh, but I don't think we'll ever get back to the pre-settlement levels. Yeah, there, I mean, there, there are areas where it's improving, there's areas where um, it's declining, um, like the Boone River. You can see how that's pretty much all purple. That was kind of cool because we have data on that going back to 1982. Um, and there's, it's been surveyed multiple times, not just with the ones I highlighted, but the Nature Conservancy paid for a couple of surveys. Um, and that one, it, you can definitely see um, an, an increase um, in, in just the number of mussels and the species that we have and, and the diversity. And actually, the highest scoring um, site overall of all the state is in the Boone River. Do you have a favorite mussel species? Um, I'm kind of partial to the, per uh, the purple wardenback and the pistol rip, just because they were the first ones I worked on as host, big host studies. Um, but we actually found um, slipper shell, which was thought to be extirpated in Iowa. And then um, I found a fresh dead purple wardenback in the lower Skunk River. Um, and so I'm hoping we still have population there. Is there a muscles for dummies? Like, for people who want to learn more but not get their masters? Um, yeah, I'm working, one of the things I want to do from the project is come up with a field guide to muscles of Iowa. But in the interim, if you Google um, a field guide to freshwater muscles of the Chicago wilderness, or even if you just Google freshwater muscles Chicago wilderness, they have a great field guide that you can download as a PDF for free, um, and it does a great job of explaining things. They don't have every species that we have here in Iowa, but they have a lot of all the common ones. Thank you, Jennifer. We appreciate it.